Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our interview with Glenn Day. Glenn is the founder at Envision X, which is a cybersecurity company. And uh, Glenn is an expert in cybersecurity, creating smart data solutions. Glenn has worked as a first uh, chief privacy officer for LA County, and he is also a retired US Navy commander in informational warfare. Glenn, thank you for coming to our interview today. Yeah, thank you, Boris, for having me. Absolutely, it's my pleasure too. Uh, Glenn, could you tell us a short story about your career path, what brought you to where you are right now, and uh, perhaps uh, in short, uh, what what you guys at Envision X are up to these days? Yeah, my, my pleasure. So as you mentioned, starting in uh, my early career uh, as a US Navy officer, first started off shooting missiles, trying to protect the company from uh, 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 actual warfare, then eventually evolving into information warfare, um, helping protect our nation's greatest secrets. Um, it's always been a priority to me on how we do this in an operational way, because the better intel that we have about what's important, the better decisions we can make about how to protect it and also how to securely share it. So with my other careers with uh, Accenture, um, Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, then eventually, as you mentioned, with uh, being the first chief privacy officer for LA County, and then most recently before starting Envision X, I was a partner at Ernst & Young, leading cybersecurity and privacy globally for the high-tech sector. And one thing I saw consistently is that companies with the best controls out there available in the market, some of the best talent out there, were still struggling to be more proactive than reactive. And uh, one of the things that I found out definitively, the better you know your data, the easier it is to protect it and control that data versus reacting to it. So that was my experience. And uh, based on some of the great technologies that have been uh, born across the world, we're taking a number of different uh, solutions to make it easier for these companies to be much better data defenders versus data firefighters. Okay, fantastic. So I believe that we will have a very thoughtful conversation on uh, data protection, uh, cybersecurity, uh, maybe with some uh, actionable, actionable tips for our members on preventing businesses from uh, cyber attacks and uh, keeping uh, their employees safe and providing device security. Glenn, can you tell us why did you choose to focus on the data security uh, privacy, uh, data security issues and why, why there was need for, for your solution? Yeah, well, one, um, data security is still one of the most um, immature capabilities uh, across the cyber uh, spectrum. Uh, huge efforts have been made uh, around vulnerability management, threat management. Um, but when you get to the, the, the data protection controls, um, access management, um, data loss prevention, um, cloud access security broker, CASB, um, and insider threat. The first thing that those controls ask you, what data do you want me to contain? And that means you're gonna block or disrupt the supply chain. And uh, historically, uh, this has been put uh, purely back on the cyber professionals. And when it comes to regulated data, such as PCI or even privacy data, um, these technologies are somewhat aware of the data attributes between having an SSN or driver's license or medical record number but when it comes to the more complex data sets, um, those are best defined by the business. And the reason we're focusing so much on data security is because that's the final objective of what these hackers want. They will break into your network. They don't want the network. They'll break into your server and application. They don't want the application. They want the data. And so they take the data, it's effectively game over, and they're able to monetize and or embarrass these companies. And they're still struggling to, to keep up on that. Mm -hmm. 
you have some companies are uh, um, operating on the topic of data risk intelligence some top companies operating on the data security field can you perhaps um, share your, um, your thoughts what are the difference between two and why uh, why there is a kind of those specific um, uh, differentiation yes yeah, from from my view um, data risk intelligence is really an evolution from data security uh, the unfortunate part is is that the security control typically comes before understanding the data. And those controls were meant to protect the data. But when you now look at it from data risk intelligence, first, data always comes first. Business data always comes first. That's the asset. Then you're trying to do this in a risk-based manner. Um, and, and, and so the intelligence then provides you, here are the data assets that need to be prioritized for elevated controls amongst all the other data that you have. So you now have a true risk-based program that's been informed by the data that's collected and processed by the business. Mm. So if you could uh, explain us, I uh, understand that you offer kind of a data risk intelligence and how does it, uh, your solution differ uh, from other software providers in this space? And what are some examples of your customers' use cases? Yeah, yeah. so there's a number of phenomenal companies out there that are doing somewhat of what we're doing, and it's primarily focused on the business data. So the ability to connect to either cloud repositories or uh, uh, network followers or databases in your data center, that's becoming more of a um, normal practice for, for, for many of these companies. They don't typically struggle that much to connect to where the data sits on the business side. But then being able to ingest and process that data um, at petabyte scale, enterprise scale for a Fortune 100, that's where things start to differ a little bit. And then be able to make sure that you're not only identifying um, the most sensitive data, you're not overly limited to regulated data because Things like intellectual property, business strategies, board communications, those matter a great deal as well. But one of the things that we do differently is as, as we inventory everything, um, we then only look at data that were classified as sensitive or higher. Those are the ones, those are the data sets that then require the oversight and inclusion on the cyber intel. So we're doing something that most companies either haven't or struggle to do, we are bringing in the analytics of business data and the most sensitive of it, we call it the jewels, to then apply the controls that are installed, compare them to your policies, your procedures and your standards, and then proactively identify anomalies where you're not aligned with their own program. So it gives you this sense of one, getting all the data, getting in control, but then two, proactively seeing risk before the risk gets out of your control and results in a breach. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So uh, um, just uh, follow up, uh, how, how do you organize uh, data controls in such a large organization, which uh, of course probably have uh, millions uh, of data or perhaps billions? Uh, is there something uh, that you need to organize prior to applying your, your solution? Yeah, so, so we never start with the cyber data first uh, because it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's supposed to be aligned first with the asset. So when you buy um, an alarm or a safe, you've got a really good idea what you're trying to protect, what are the points of entries and exit, um, and, and, and what those controls will do. Unfortunately, since there's been a strained relationship uh, between business and IT, the business has struggled to effectively communicate to IT and cyber on what assets matter most um, outside what's regulated and really the regulations define what that looks like. But once you figure out the data, where it sits, then you start to say for critical data here, here, and here, let me look at the vulnerability manager profiles, the DOP CASB, the access control list to ensure that need to know access is being applied. And let me also look at the activity logs, not for everything that's happening for every data asset, but those that are most sensitive. So it allows you to have a more focused view. 
and a lot less false controls or loss, uh, false alarms once you put these two together. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. I would like to ask you a personal point of view. Uh, for example, what is the commonly held belief in your space of data, data management or data security as a, that you are strongly or even uh, passionately disagree with, just to understand? That, that's, that's a great one. And, and one of the things about um, what we do and, and about data protection, what we found and were informed by some of our biggest customers is that a big problem that people are not fully aware of is that most companies are unfortunately data hoarders. They're retaining data well beyond its useful life. Some of that data is extremely sensitive includes expired patient data or expired customer or even expired employees. And if you don't let that data die, that respects the records retention policies, as well as the value of what this data still holds, those assets become liabilities and it requires you to protect and be exposed to more risk than you need to. As an example, Boris, we've seen a few children's hospital keep data for children decades ago in which these children are now grandparents. <laughs> and, and, and then we look at the data, it's like, they're not even accessing or getting value from it. It's just sitting there and it increases their compliance scope. It increases their risk and it increases their, their, their cost. Another dirty secret, people think that as storage goes down year over year, that enterprise storage is cheap. It is cheap to buy, it is not cheap to own, and companies are spending millions more than they need to because they haven't let the data die and, they have, and, and they're taking on these additional risk concerns. So if there's anything that anyone gets, help clean up the mess, get rid of the data that's making you sick and making you uh, at greater risk, and also save millions of dollars in enterprise storage by cleaning up the house. Mm, great example. So uh, if we take a life of uh, work uh, experience of uh, average risk manager, compliance manager, how he had to start, uh, what are maybe first two steps to start uh, uh, implementing what you preach in, uh, if, if he is not uh, or she is not aware about this? Yeah, yeah. So our, our platform takes a very methodical and logical approach around implementing data risk intelligence. And we also break it up to the different stakeholders of who we want to interact with, in which they're experts in the domains that we need to understand before these controls are actually implemented. And it always starts with data first. First, what data provides you the most concern or has the highest risk, at least notionally? What data is it? And then tell me what you know of where it sits and what you don't know will fill in the gaps. So we're going to give you a full profile. I just need you to give me a place to start. So if you tell me that we've got privacy data in this CRM and it's also stored uh, via a SharePoint and we also have some over in Box and of course email communications are typically part of the paradigm with that. We will look at all the data in that CRM, and then we'll start to look at the activity logs of what people do when they download it from the CRM, either as a CSV or PDF, and the other places it starts to go. So we're following the data and understanding. Once we get an appreciation of that, we'll then start classifying those and seeing what data is most sensitive with the business owner, it's their data. And then once we get that confirmed, will then start to ingest the cyber intel so we can understand where else this data is being sent and what controls are supposed to be there versus which ones are actually there to reduce the risk. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so right. we, go, we start with the business, then it goes to the cyber team. And from the, from, from the uh, purge perspective, once again, we're looking at the two extremes. We then talk to legal and records management. Mm -hmm. So if we go uh, for for like ne next two or few or five years, where do you think the data privacy as a whole is uh, heading? What are the trends in, in the, the this industry, and what what should we expect from you guys in the future? 
Yeah. So I, I think things are gonna a few things are gonna happen primarily based on the the newer laws coming from the EU around GDPR and most recently around the California Consumer Privacy Rights that becomes effective in one January. 2003. So these rules have this little benign thing that's really powerful with the right to be forgotten. And it says that when you've got a customer, patient, or employee, that you no longer have to hold their data for any regulatory or, or legal purpose, um, and they want that data to be purged, you've got to do that in a timely way, and you've got to do it completely wherever that data sits. And if not, there's considerable fines and penalties that can apply if you don't uh, re respond to that. What that little thing does, Boris, it resets the expectation of how capable companies need to be to be able to find that data and then purge it on demand. And it will imply other key factors such as e-discovery that typically says, what is reasonable? There's no sense of reasonableness when it comes to the right to be forgotten. There's no exceptions. So if it's an archive, no exceptions. You might get more time, but you've got to get it all. That concept says you're in full control. And once you're in full control, you'll see so many other data-driven functions start to be improved, be more efficient, be more reliable. We're going to elevate expectations of both business and IT on how much of, how much more efficient companies can be and no longer relying on the fact that we've got too much data. Mm. Sorry. All right. <laughs> no, it's a very interesting. So I know I, I as a community leader, uh, we have also some requests to delete uh, some dead, all data for few people only for, for 10 years, maybe a few, few, few people only two or three. So it's, it will be coming also from uh, American people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So if we summarize uh, our interview, if someone is, who is listening uh, and would like to take to walk away with uh, one or two major takeaways, what would that be? Yeah, so so one of the things I, I, I really want to share is that I really do understand what these companies are going through from both a cyber, um, a privacy and compliance perspective, as well as an overall data risk. And one of the things I have to emphasize is that the vast majority of the controls that these companies have invested in, such as DOP and need to know access, they actually work. It's not the controls as much as it is the lack of business intelligence that these controls are provided so they can give you better outcomes to actually reduce the risk. These controls are always based on garbage in, garbage out. And unfortunately, a lot of my cyber brothers and sisters out there have been put in the unfortunate position that they know business data across the enterprise. It is impossible for them to know it any better than the business owners that create and process this data. You get them to the table, you'll see those controls improve overnight. Fantastic. So uh, as a global risk community, we are a community of people operating in the risk and compliance uh, area. What would your suggestion for us to contribute better uh, to understanding of this complex world of risk? What what we should do? I ask this all my guests, so just to <laughs> for us uh, to to get some tips. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so so my my focus uh, would be my recommendation would be. Um, You've got to work better um, in a collaboration uh, perspective. There's a lot of silos that are putting companies at risk unnecessarily. We've got organizational silos. Once again, business and IT and cyber professionals are struggling to better communicate and collaborate to see data risk in a uniform way. And as well as uh, so many different silos between structured and unstructured data, between the business data and the cyber. Start to break down those silos you'll see your expectations and objectives of risk reduction come to life. All right, fantastic, Glenn. Those were all my questions. Perhaps if I forgot to ask you something and that you want to add, uh, please go ahead. No, I, I, I think you, you covered it all. I think there's a, yeah. a lot of information and I truly appreciate the opportunity. 
All right. Thank you very much, Glenn. It was a very informative interview, and I hope uh, to see you in a few months, uh, maybe with an update or some new topic to discuss. It would be my pleasure, Boris. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you.